is Jennifer Daniel. I work at a small ad company called Google. Uh, this is a picture of me smiling. This is a picture of me flirting. This is a picture of me preparing my slides for this conference. <laughs> this is a picture of Michael Jordan. <laughs> and this is a picture of the entire plot to the movie Dune. Anyone, any Dune fans out there? We can talk about it later. This is a picture of the entire plot of the year 2016, to 2018, effectively. So in fact, our visual vocabulary these days is fairly vast. But it wasn't too long ago that if I wanted to communicate through uh, instant messenger that I was sad, I had to type, I'm sad. And then emoticons came around and you could express yourself this way and your friends would be like, whoa, you're really sad. And then emoji came around and everyone was really sad. Although, admittingly, I also use this to express how proud I am of someone, or, uh, like, it's a very confusing emoji, to be honest. <laughs> and it didn't take long for opportunists to say, I like that, can I make money off of that? And so now we have a bunch of custom emoji, like Kimoji and just emoji, and they're not really emoji technically, they're more like stickers, but I'll get into that later. Also. Quick shout out to my favorite emoji pack by Michael Phelps. <laughs> it is basically 30 images of him in a swimsuit. For those times when you feel like black swimsuit, black swimsuit with yellow thread, <laughs> when you're just kissing your metal. So Michael Phelps, I feel you, this really spoke to me. Today we're going to spend some time looking at the divergence of communication and messaging. And one way to look through it is through our visual vocabulary and the inventory that it makes up. So we have emojis and GIFs and stickers, and they all make up this sort of emergent complexity. And contrary to what we commonly think, texting is really closer to speaking. So if we think about language, it's existed for perhaps 150,000 years, at least 80,000 years, and first it arose as speech people talked. Writing came along much, much later. And there's controversy around when that happened exactly, but John McCoulter, who is a uh, professor at Columbia University focusing on linguistics, uh, he supposes that if humanity has been around for about 24 hours, that language came around 11.07 p.m., right? So that is to illustrate that at first there was speech, and then much, much later, writing. And writing and talking are very different ways of communicating. How you write is different than how you talk. Writing is a conscious process. You can look forwards and backwards and be reflective and do things with language that are very less likely than when you're talking. Now, linguistics have shown that when you're speaking in an unmonitored way, you usually speak in word packets to like seven to 10 words. That's what speech is like. It's looser, it's telegraphic, and it's much less reflective. I don't think about punctuation when I'm speaking. No one thinks about capitalization when they're texting. And we don't do that, uh, when you don't do that when you're speaking, when you're texting, there's a lot more similarities. Really, texting is like fingered speech. You text the way you talk. And now we talk with words, and yes, with gifs and memes and emojis, and sometimes all at the same time. And while the sources of many of these images are largely defined by, are, are not largely defined by a single person or subculture, there is one that no one can really make except for corporations, and that's emoji. First, what are emojis? The word is Japanese, means picture, character. These were the original emoji set. They were very popular in Japan. The humanity that emoji offered via text allowed for nuance. Many people citing that emoji were an easy way to apologize when words couldn't express enough and messages without emoji just felt too dry. 
Emoji were on three semi-compatible mobile vendors in Japan, which were rendered in three very different ways, and they also had nothing to do with Unicode, which I'll get into in a second. Emoji, Emoji only really came around um, when Western tech companies wanted to sell phones in Japan. So companies like Apple and Google and Microsoft, to appeal to this new audience that they wanted to talk to, were like, wow, how are we going to support the system? And so they turned to Unicode. And they said, Unicode, since you are already responsible for mapping little bitmapped characters and images and umlauts, could you take on these emojis in Unicode? No one had been paying attention to them ever. Said, yes. Please give me something interesting. And so now we have Unicode and emoji. And so what is Unicode? Basically, Unicode is as close as what to what we get to universal encoding. Unicode says, these are characters on a list, and this is what they mean and this is what their names are, and this is what they map between legacy encodings, and it creates a universal character set. That is Unicode. And so now, true to Emoji's name, Emoji is defined by these two attributes, the picture that a user sees and the code that it is defined by. So, despite Unicode's valiant efforts to try and unify Emoji, they continue to be rendered by companies as a means to basically establish a consistent branded user experience. Other emoji styles, be damned. And emojis are increasingly becoming no joke, right? They are massively popular. 92% of the online population use emojis. Six billion emojis are sent every day. Half of all the comments on Instagram include an emoji. What's truly remarkable to me, though, is how some of the most popular companies are designing their emoji. Take, for instance, astonished face. This is supposed to be one distinct expression, but I see eight, right? Uh, Samsung has had entirely too much Red Bull. Uh, LG, let's see, LG, poor LG, he looks like he's just dead on arrival. What else do we have? We have um, Facebook and Microsoft. A lot of dilation, they've been doing too much ecstasy. This whole like, little ecosystem we have here is a big problem when you're just trying to text your friend that they surprised you. We have one emoji, eight breeds of dogs. Oh, uh, this is the crescent moon emoji. This is, this is not a very popular emoji, I admit. But what I love about it is, yes, it is a crescent moon, clearly, but it's also a septum piercing. Uh, some cheese, a rotten banana, and a toenail, right? This is not just a moon. There's so much to read into it. But the real problem is when it comes when you're texting someone. So this is a text that I have sent to my husband. Work was crazy today with this little octopus that's like, work was crazy today, right? That is how I feel. It was crazy. Also, I'm wearing orange like the octopus, which was not intentional. Uh, and so this, I have a pixel. So this is what it looks like to me. I sent it to my husband who has an Apple phone. He gets this. <laughs> I said, work was crazy. And he gets, work was crazy. You want sushi? So the meanings are totally different. This is at least ruined, this is at least put us into some kind of argument here and there, maybe some therapy. Um, the audacity of corporations deciding the meaning of framed picture is what really gets me going. Because I get to interpret the meaning of a picture within a frame. For example, I would like to use this picture frame emoji to describe an idealization, right? The, that's the idea of a picture frame, of a picture. Like, wow, must be so nice to be sure of your worldview. But I send this to a friend, and they get <laughs> some silly cat. Or if my friend's on a Samsung, the Mona Lisa. Like, that, that, and that. What? That doesn't make any sense. Like, this is ridiculous. This, why, why, who wants this? And this pursuit of creating some sort of universal iconography is aspirational, but that isn't actually what's happening. Instead, in this pursuit of branding and marketing, the style and detail of these emojis are offering brands an opportunity to say, look at me. 
And to be fair, aesthetics are largely opinionated, and it's hard to divorce style from message. The peach emoji is a great example of how style renders meaning, and how in spite of a brand, how Apple would love to control its image, the people, you and I, ultimately decide what is a peach and what is a butt. So Apple original, original peach design is on the left. They tried to redesign it to this monstrosity, and everyone freaked out, and so they brought back this plumpy, delicious peach. But this goes beyond style. Every year, the Unicode Consortium reviews petitions for new emoji. But instead of thinking of emoji as imagery that can build on text and provide nuance, most of these requests include adding some more nouns like a juggler or Mrs. Santa Claus, which is fascinating because ultimately they are asking for acknowledgement, to be seen or to be heard or to be recognized in an illustration system they don't recognize, recognize themselves in. This need is primal. But at the rate new emojis are being added to the database, I can't help but wonder, are we doing a very good job here? It was not long ago that Unicode only had like 500 emoji, and now we have 3,000 emoji. At what point will emojis be outdated and stop providing additional value to what already exists in our lexicon? If we take a closer look at emoji usage per language, there are, even, there are more similarities than differences. The most popular emojis are largely emotional and symbols, not objects like pickup trucks or a glass of white wine. Universally, we're seeing people want to express something positive. I don't see any angry emojis here, despite it being very easy to express anger online. I love that in Thai, one of the popular emojis is a hug emoji, but in the States, it's crying or laughing to the point of tears. What you start to realize is there's lots of threads to pull on about how people are the same but different. And of course, cultural differences play a large part in the design of emoji. The dumpling emoji is simultaneously like a great and awful example of this. When it was first proposed a couple years ago, the individuals who put the proposal together aimed for, quote, a little contribution to cross-cultural communication in the age of globalization. And I loved that. What an exciting thought. But at the end of the day, it's Apple and Google and Microsoft and all the other vendors who interpret what it means to be a dumpling. And so we got this. We got a gyoza, a pierogi, an empanada, a Chinese dumpling. I mean, abstractly, the idea of a dumpling is remarkably universal, but if you would ask people from around the world to close their eyes and imagine a dumpling, they'd all imagine very different things, and so we're left with this mess. While we normally don't think of emoji as a place for creativity like art and music, individuals and communities of the world are injecting meaning into seemingly meaninglessness, like an art or like music. So a friend of mine, Damien, he texts elephant shoe to his wife instead of hearts. And that's because when you mouth elephant shoe, it looks like you're saying, I love you. How cute is that? That's ridiculously cute. My friend Julia pairs these two emojis together to describe when she's having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> My friend Matt uses a sequence to merely communicate that we're seeing eye to eye. And my colleague Ryan evokes the second place medal to connote parenting blunders, like when his daughter falls off the slide. And I love that. And while we go through life mostly unaware of it, humans mimic each other's expressions and emotions when we're talking in person. This emotional contagion is a big part of how we show empathy and we build relationships. According to a recent study published in the Journal of Social Neuroscience, looking at faces crafted from colons and parentheses can trigger the same facial recognition response in parts of the brain that take place when we gaze into the eyes of real people in meet space. How cool is that? That's why it's so important to understand that if emojis and emoticons and GIFs are the way we digitally express emotion and empathy, and that these emojis are largely defined and curated by corporations and private consortiums, it's a curious thing to consider that when you're texting your wife, I love you, or elephant shoe, is this merely an extension of a corporate brand, or an extension of how you feel, or both. Speaking of brands, I do work for one. 
Google recently redesigned their gumdrop emojis. And if you're measuring a redesign on the metric of being more universally understood, it was probably the right decision. But to totally contradict everything I have just said for the past, I don't know, like 10 minutes, I really miss the old emojis. Look at her. <laughs> what is she? I love you. She's so freak. We miss her so much. So we lost her innocence. We lost her delight. And what I loved about that emoji system is that it it connected Google to that spirit as well, Google's own delightfulness. And instead, of course, if I were to text that character and my husband got that character, he would think I was in the mood tonight and I would just be like, oh, I'm just chilling, I'm just having a good time. Super sexualized, just being herself. That's a problem. So instead we have these, which is fine, I guess. Uh, it's really important that emojis work cross-platform, as we discussed, but um, the original description for this Unicode character is just, quote, a person dancing. Does this new dancer represent African dance? Polynesian dancing? Boogie woogie? Why is she so sexy? So my curiosity in the emoji space has somehow, somehow parlayed into an actual job. And so now I effectively am the creative director of the Google Emoji program, which is really awesome to say to my parents. <laughs> but no one will convince me otherwise that the blob emoji were not the best emoji system that ever existed. So first order of business was to bring back the blobs, not officially, but just as an animated sticker pack. Uh, so if you too miss the blobs, you can access them in Gboard, which is available on iOS and Android and blah, blah, blah. But uh, I love them all. There's like 50 of them. And of course, we got my dancer. <laughs> Look at her. I love you. <sighs> but I don't just work on emoji. I also work on a few other things like camera effects. Uh, and my team works directly with artists. So some of these uh, camera effects, oh, they're not working. Hey, there we go, love it. Okay, so we work directly with artists. So the one on the far left is by Zach Lieberman. Two in the middle are Tracy Ma. Far right is by Eric Carter, who's the art director for the program. And these are GIFs, right? They're not like, they have no audio. It is taken with your camera, but effectively they're in the GIF format, which means that they loop infinitely your weird and dumb facial expressions. But of course, because it's Google, all of these are very high tech. Another program my team works on is Avatars. We call them minis. You snap a photo, and using a combination of ML and artistry, we turn you into a stickerified character. So this is Mia, and there is Mia and a bunch of expressions. Uh, to kind of show you the potential of this, I did a, oh wait, this is me, actually, before I get to that other slide. Uh, what I love about illustration versus photography is that illustration allows me to define who I am. It's warmer and less fraught than reality. So on the inside, so like, I take a picture, the computer says, this is what you look like, okay? But this is how I feel. I feel like a bald woman with a bicycle seat-shaped head. That's how I feel. And no amount of ML will ever learn that is how I feel on the inside. So what I love about this is, yes, the ML can generate an image somewhat in my likeness, but effectively, I can customize it to really feel like myself. And so I did a couple examples of our hosts, Daniel and Un. So, I did it from memory, I hope, I feel like I would change a couple things here. But you can get a sense of like, and this is also, not to like plug, but if you would like to try this, it's available on Gboard, and please do share it with me. I love seeing what people make with this little tool. Um, so, okay, that's my whole pitch. For the sake of focusing this chat to be only 30 seconds, I'm gonna speak mostly about emoji, but I'm happy to talk about the other things anytime later tonight. So this year, 80 new emojis came out, including a raccoon, a tooth, uh, bacteria. But of course, the addition of this new lobster forces me to think, okay, we got a lobster emoji. Is this food or is this an animal? Which group does it go in? Emoji UX is be goes beyond the design of the glyphs, right? It's the whole experience that emojis exist in. So is that snowman an activity or is it a weather? Is the rose a 
symbol or is it nature? Is the sun with a face, is that a smiley or is that weather? So you're presented with lots of complex notions of how people perceive visualizations through the categorization that Unicode develops, which I then petition because it seems broken. Love them or hate them, everyone has an opinion on emojis, and most people are not shy about expressing them to me. One way I get insight into these opinions is people filing bugs against emojis, like you would code. So someone recently this year pointed out that our what was it? I always get this wrong. Yeah, the cricket emoji was actually a grasshopper. So we had to make it a cricket, obviously. Another example is a salad emoji. Someone wrote in in an attempt to hold Google accountable to Unicode standards, and they complained that the salad emoji was unnecessarily not vegan friendly. <sighs> so I checked and they were right. We got an egg in there. I myself have never eaten a salad, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> so we changed it, took out the egg. Here we are, and this is what happened. <laughs> Turns out, people have a very strong opinion about vegans. And emoji design is subject to the same polarizing forces of opinion that we experience all over the internet. So if someone has a strong opinion, on X, they're gonna have a strong opinion on X emoji. This is how I got Trump. Another emoji design uh, consideration that can be more subtle, like the magnet emoji. Simply rotating at 45 degrees changes it from a noun to a verb. So you can use it to connect words, other emojis, or anything else in line. So, you know, when I'm hustling to get that money, or when I'm alone with a kid, or when you get two kids. <laughs> Other times, design decisions are focused on merely bringing back some love to characters that really just needed a hug, like our poor turtle. What happened to you? I don't know. They didn't love you, whoever they look like. like it's just so sad. Anyways, we have this new guy. But this was the turtle before. So cute, right? That's what I'm talking about. Beloved Android turtle dude. Someone even wrote him a poem, quote, a beautiful friend, a wonderful smile. I will protect this perfect tortoise with my life. Thank you. <laughs> I feel it. I would protect this tortoise with their life too. Sadly, the blob turtle didn't conform to other popular vendors. We got like the logo, remember the logo? That yeah, anyone who else here is old like I am, anyone's known? So we got this friendly guy, and then we got like, I don't know, Unc Uncle Stewart. <laughs> he seems okay, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with the legs over there. There's three legs on Microsoft. <laughs> <sighs> so we had to change it. And I really wish that we lived in a world where Facebook turtle, Uncle Stewart, and our turtle could coexist, just like fonts. Technically, emoji are rendered like a font, but not in the way I really wish they were. Like, I wish I could see all the variations of astonished face earlier or on my phone instead of just the one my carrier has designed. After all, fonts, like emojis, are brands in their own way. When you use Helvetica, you're using 60 years of Helvetica's legacy. Right? They'd get along. Be like the odd couple a little bit. He'd be annoyed by him a lot, but he'd see his potential. They'd be cute. What's happening now is sort of an assimilation uh, to help reduce cross-platform inconsistency. So this emoji is called Alien Monster. And Apple, Twitter, WhatsApp, et cetera, they all designed something from uh, Space Invaders. Google did this other thing. And so, of course, you know, when you start auditing all the emoji, you have to assimilate. Resistance is futile. Well, there is some room for creativity in what I call emoji ligatures, but they're technically referred to as ZWJ sequences. This is how emoji libraries scale and how corporations can create unique glyphs. If your phone wants to render a rainbow flag, it's actually a ligature of the white flag and the rainbow flag. Many emojis exist or are created like this.
As a regular person who uses emojis a lot, I want to make so many more. Like this guy, when you combine the roll up, rolling your eyes and the hug emoji to sarcastically console my friend Becky when she doesn't fit into that dress that she wished she could fit into. Like, I'm so sorry, Becky. It doesn't exist, but I wish it did. Imagine a world where you could combine loudly crying emoji and every man in the world. You could make everyone cry. Or you just want to say, like, not a hundred. It's like, no chill. You've got zero chill. Chill out. Zero chill. Or, like, I got my period. No emoji for that. Ridiculous. I really love pretzels. I love them a lot. Uh, <laughs> this emoji is mostly for my husband, because he's my only friend. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Uh, I just don't want to know. Just put all the monkeys in together. Just do not tell me. I do not want to know. Or I'm trying to be better. I'm trying. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to be better. And this is the beautiful thing about language is that it evolves and words don't stand still. That's, that's, that's what's great about language and slang. It's, it's like water. It's fluid. Think about um, lol, right? Laughing out loud. So I text my friend, or not text, I like ping them, I'm checking my email, lol. I'm not laughing, I'm checking my email. But you know you've done this, and you do it because you're using lol as a marker of empathy, right? It doesn't actually mean laughing out loud anymore. You're just saying, I'm chill, just checking my email, lol, ain't nothing. It's being like a sign of accommodation. It's like a pragmatic particle which now means that like, you have to type LMAO when you're actually laughing, right? Like, lol doesn't mean actually laughing. Now you have to rely on other kinds of media or uh, punctuation to communicate laughter. And language emerges from human minds interacting with another. It's visible in the unstoppable change we see through slang and jargon and the formation of new languages like texting. And I love this quote, that loneliness does not come from being alone, but from not being able to communicate things that seem important. And trivial things can seem very important, like emoji. So regardless of what Unicode approves in its inventory, how big tech renders it, we, the people, create language. And we will never look at eggplant the same way again. If I have learned anything from history, it's that if you give humanity a bunch of symbols, we will ascribe meaning to them, and we will use them to say whatever we want. Because storytelling is from the people, and the symbol just brands it and sells it. So now, I don't have the words to really express how I feel. I have a lot of questions that I don't have answers to, but I do know that I am feeling party popper, party popper, raised hands, dolphin emoji, because after me, Noah's going to speak, and after Noah, we're all going to get drinks. So thank you for your time. Had a good time. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.